let's continue to look at the neuron here. Now over here we see a neuron as we saw in a previous video. Here we can see the neuron cell body also called the soma with the dendrites which are again are the input part where the neuron receives signals and here's the axon, the output part leading down to some other cell with a synapse, a little space or junction in between them. But we mentioned before in the previous video, <clears throat> these axons will have this myelin sheath around them. That is lipids, it's what the structure is, and it makes great insulation. Just like rubber around a copper wire in any electric appliance, it insulates and holds that electric signal in the axon. Figure if you didn't have something to insulate and hold that electric signal in those axons, they jump to go to some other place. If you had a nerve where there was a bundle of axons, you couldn't control where one electric signal was going. No way you can maintain homeostasis. You'd have some big problems. <clears throat> now, looking at this myelin sheath and these Schwann cells here, which are making it, notice these little spaces, these tiny little gaps called the nodes of Ranvier in between them. Those little gaps are good. The reason they're good to have is because they will allow electric signals to jump from gap to gap, and that allows electric signals to travel faster. This can be compared to something like a bug, like a grasshopper. Maybe as he's walking, he moves slow, but as he's hopping, he moves fast. It's exactly what happens, because remember when these action potentials that we call electric signals are generated, it's one after another. One of them's not moving the length of the axon, you're just creating one next to another, next to another, and so on. And if they can jump from gap to gap, they will move faster, and that's good. The fact that electric signals travel very fast is one of the good things about them. You figure you touch a hot stove, you need that finger off of it very quickly. So that jumping and that speeding up of those electric signals is a great thing to have. There are times in which that myelin sheath is lost. You may have heard of multiple sclerosis. That's one time. Can happen with diabetes mellitus and also some autoimmune diseases too. Maybe some places where you don't see any myelin with the axons, maybe in some of the little depressions around the Schwann cells and the oligodendrocytes, and also the gray matter. The gray matter of the brain and spinal cord is areas where you have the neuron cell body and the dendrite, and then some of the supporting cells, which we covered in another video too, which are called the glial cells. So look at this little cross-section of spinal cord, and we'll get to all the parts and pieces of this in another video. <clears throat> but notice how you can see where the white and gray matter is at. Again, anywhere you see the white matter, those are areas where you have axons with the myelin around it. That myelin has that very light whitish appearance to it. Anywhere you see the gray matter areas, those are areas where you don't have myelin and axons. That's where you'll find the neuron cell bodies, uh, their dendrites, any of the little supporting cells right along with them. So good little picture right there showing white and gray matter. And when you look at a cross section of brain, you can find the same. But in the brain, <clears throat> the gray matter is superficial to the outside. And then the white matter is deeper to the inside. Cortex is always the outer region. Medulla is always the deeper inner region. We'll see that in many different places throughout these chapters too. So here we see in the brain, the gray matter is in the outer regions called the cortex. What the cortex will always be is the outer region of something. But again, when it comes to spinal cord, white matters in the outer cortex region. So those white and gray areas are swapped when it comes to brain and spinal cord. And when you look at a cross section of brain, you'll be able to see that. Now let's look a little bit more at these electric signals. Again, that's what action potentials are travel very rapidly down these axons, also down the cell membrane of a muscle too. You may have seen that in another video. So it's good that they travel very fast. They're good for communication. And you look at these electric signals and where they come from. Well, they come from ions. <clears throat> Remember that ions are charged particles. And if you look at some of these three very abundant and important charged particles in the body, in and around these cells, sodium, calcium, and potassium are three of those very big ones. And the cell likes to keep most of the sodium and calcium in the extracellular environment and more of the potassium on the inside. But point being, more of the positive ion is kept generally to the outside of the cell, more of the negative materials on the inside. And at any time you let some of this positive ion in, you swap these charges. That's depolarization. And when you depolarize these cells, that's when action potentials are generated. So looking at these concentration differences of these ions, 
Remember, there are pumps for these ions, little proteins in the cell membrane that can use up ATP to move this material where they want, when they want. And when you look at those proteins in that cell membrane, <clears throat> the one primarily responsible for setting up the resting membrane potential, which is when you have the positive charge on the outside and the negative charge on the inside, the protein primarily responsible for that is the sodium-potassium exchange pump. Every time this little protein burns up an ATP, it'll pump three sodium out of the cell into potassium in. There's also a lot of non-gated channels for potassium. So as this potassium builds up on the inside of the cell, it will diffuse right back out, adding to that outside positive charge. So that sodium potassium pump has many functions throughout the body, depending on where it's at for what. But when it comes up to setting up resting membrane potentials, it's very big. So if you look at some common extracellular ions, sodium and calcium we mentioned, chloride's another. Most chloride channels tend not to have gates. So wherever the sodium goes, chloride follows. With intracellular ions, potassium's a big one. But there's also a lot of proteins and phosphates inside the cell, and those tend to have negative charges right there. So there's that sodium-potassium pump pumping sodium out, potassium in. We'll see other functions of that protein and other parts of the body further along in other sections. But looking at permeability characteristics is plasma membrane. That's been covered back when you looked at the cell. Remember, if you look at a cell membrane in our body, it's roughly half lipid, half protein. There's some carbs there and so on, but you've seen discussion of these phospholipids. Remember that cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, two layers of those lipids. And what you see scattered all in between those lipids are lots of proteins. There may be three million or so of those proteins in the cell membrane of a lot of cells right there. So with these proteins, the cell likes to keep most of them to the inside of the cell as we mentioned before. And those proteins, most all of them tend to have negative charges, so that's going to count for a lot of that negative charge on the inside of the cell. Looking at the chloride, since it has the same charge as the proteins negative, they tend to be repelled. And as we said before, where the sodium goes, the chloride tends to follow since they have opposing charges. Everybody's heard that before. But when it comes to these ion channels that keep these ions on one side of the cell membrane or the other, they can be opened or closed. And those ion channels with gates, right, just like a gate on a fence, if it's closed, nothing can pass. If it's open, things can. Well, if those channels need to be opened or closed, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. And by using chemical signals is one of them. You look at hormones in the body, neurotransmitters or whatever. What a lot of those chemicals do are open ion channels and let those ions move. If you figured if you opened up, say, like some sodium channels and let a lot of that positive sodium into this cell, those charges would swap. And if they do, you get depolarization and you're going to generate an action potential, which is an electric signal. But looking at other protein channels in those cell membranes, some of them are called leak channels, which are non-gated. They don't have any gates. Whatever on that that protein is specific to <clears throat> can pass whenever it wants. So you can see there are a lot of those for potassium, as we mentioned before, and a lot of them for chloride. Again, as potassium's pumped in, you build up a high concentration inside the cell, it's going to diffuse out its non-gated channels, moving from high to low out. Chloride doesn't, have to tend, doesn't tend to have ch uh, gates on its channels. Wherever sodium goes, it's going to follow right there, too. And again, to the inside of the cell, lots of proteins, lots of negative charges on that and phosphates also. So these leak channels here are always open. And remember, each one of these proteins is specific to one particular ion right there. But point being, without gates, the ion can pass any time it wants. But again, a lot of those protein channels do have gates. The ligand-gated we mentioned before, and you saw a ligand-gated sodium channel. If you've seen the neuromuscular junction between a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle cell. Again, if you want to tell one of your skeletal muscles to contract, you can have a motor neuron release acetylcholine into the synapse, a little space in between that neuron and that muscle cell. And whenever that acetylcholine gets to that skeletal muscle cell, it opens up the ligand-gated sodium channels. You let that sodium into that cell, 
the charges will swap, you'll generate an electric signal. So you'll see many different examples of ligand gated channels in many different places throughout the body doing different things. But there are also voltage gated channels. You have proteins with gates that will open or close in response to voltage. You're talking again about electric signals. You move those ions and swap those charges, you can open up these voltage gated channels. So when you look at the different types of ion channels we look at, <clears throat> again, some of them are non-gated, the leak, those don't have gates, so they're always open. There's the ligand gated. They only open or close in response to a chemical signal. That's what has to bind to them and change the shape of the protein and open the gates. But again, the voltage gated will open or close in response to voltage changes. You're moving those ions and creating electric signals. So you'll see all these used in many different places in many cells for many different reasons. We're going to touch on a lot of those throughout these chapters. So there's also a few other types we'll see in a few different sections where they talk about different types of sensory receptors like touch receptors. If you look at these sort of shallow, close to the surface, superficial here, uh, close to the top of the skin. Well, in these regions, some of them can detect touch because when you apply pressure to the protein, the pressure causes the gates to open. Ions pour in. Again, the charges are going to swap and electric signals will be generated. And that electric signal zip back to your brain and that signal will tell you about touch or pressure in a particular place. There's also temperature thermoreceptors you'll see in different areas of the body. What happens with these? Proteins are very temperature specific. In other words, they keep one particular shape at a particular temperature. So if the temperature around these little thermoreceptors changes, the shape of the protein changes. The gates open, the ions come in, electric signals generated, zips back to your brain, and you know there's a temperature change. So we'll see these different types of receptors here in many different places. Just depends on what their function is.